fear it can, it comes in all shapes and sizes and it's universal it comes to everybody it doesn't matter your your economic status or your you know, your your background your walks of life it, fear is is a, a constant in everyone's world particularly in modern day society where you don't just hunt the mammoth run from the mammoth then you can relax even though anxiety can come in different forms for everybody um, how everyone deals with that is kind of the measure of people and I, and I think that it is when you push through that when you step outside your comfort zone that's really when you the greatest adventures are to be had and the greatest rewards are to be had as well <laughs> Today on the show, we are joined with writer and director of The Secret Kingdom. And as of now, The Secret Kingdom is available on VOD and is in select theaters all across America. It was so fun to pick Matt's brain the morning of the release of this film because this is just something I thoroughly enjoyed. This film reminded me of the kind of movies that I used to watch growing up. And even recently I was thinking, what happened to those crazy dark adventures such as like a labyrinth, a return to Oz, never ending story. And why don't people make those anymore? Well, Matt's vision in the secret kingdom is totally in that vein. And this is a family friendly movie that I think a lot of the adults who grew up in the eighties and nineties would really appreciate as well. We dive in on how many years it took to put this movie together, where the seed of the idea came from, extra details on the creature effects, the acting, the themes of the film all across the board, and Matt leaves you with some amazing advice for anybody who is an aspiring filmmaker themselves. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Here's Matt Drummond, the creator of The Secret Kingdom. Good morning, how are you? Well, good uh, evening, where you are? Yeah, I'm uh, East Coast right now, uh, 7 uh, p.m. Uh, how about you in Australia? Yeah, I'm down in Tasmania, and it's uh, just gone 9 a.m. on Saturday. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, welcome. Thanks for uh, getting up early on the weekend. And also, no. biggest congratulations today here in North America. The movie came out and everything. I know. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, you, actually, you're the first one I've spoken to post the release. Oh, I'm so, I'm like so honored for that too, and uh, even like honored to watch this uh, early too. It was a uh, just such a fun movie, and um, even prior to this talk, I knew I was talking to the director of this film. And then as the credits rolled, it said also written by you, and I can't imagine the time you have put into this from writing, creating a universe, directing, and finally having the release today. So just kind of. How do you overall feel in like uh, of this journey? Look, it has been a very long one. Um, the post production, in particular, was a very long journey. In fact, I um, I did some math and sort of took an average eight hour day and then multiplied that by the number of you know hours it actually worked. And it worked out. I worked out about I'd worked for about six point eight years in two and a half. Wow. So, <laughs> It was very, very long days and, and a lot of work went into it. But, um, yeah, look, I'm really pleased with the results. And and uh, it's been, you know, it seems to be received very well by the, the, the target market and beyond as well. Mm -hmm, definitely. And uh, even I thought it was a nice palate cleanse for me because people who follow these interview segments may have noticed I'm just – recently been doing a lot of like gory action films and horror too so yeah. this was such like a good one for my soul and also uh what i really appreciated about this movie is it reminded me of some of the films i grew up watching as a kid like uh the fantasies such as like a never-ending story or a return to oz like just kind of had that vibe to it of like the world and the characters and everything. And I want to know, did you also like grow up on those type of films as well? Oh, absolutely. I, in fact, even though I, I didn't actively go after that aesthetic or that, that is kind of choices. Um, they're so ingrained in my DNA that they just mm -hmm. can't help but come through, you know, all of those films. Uh, yeah. I'm a child of the eighties. Yeah. That's so awesome. And, uh, even um, 
when I watch something like that or like think about those styles of films too, I'm always like just so fascinating about the process of the world building too, even to the point where I imagine like, how does one start with the seed of the idea and then start building characters, creatures, rules and everything? And what was kind of like the seed of the idea for the Secret Kingdom for you to start building this? Yeah, well, look, I mean, it, the it's a good question because the seed of the idea actually came from the the exploration of some of the the underlying narratives, you know, of anxiety and those kind of things. But there was one image that popped into my mind in particular, which was the the kids on the bed being whisked underground by tiny little creatures rolled up as balls. And I, you know, I've always thought. Um, I thought that was a, a really compelling image and I was given some really great advice by uh, a guy I worked with many years ago who said, whatever you do, show the audience something you've never seen before. Mm. And that's something I'd never seen before. And I thought, okay, there, there's something here with that. And so then it, it really became a, a process of sketching ideas and looking for the right animals, you know, to, to embody those well, it was the penguins, but to embody the wheels of the bed. And, um, yeah, I had seen this little gif of a of an armadillo that was just was just there and then it was in a ball in an instant, you know, and that really, that inspired me to go looking. I mean, because armadillos are great, but they weren't particularly exotic. Everyone had seen an armadillo, but the penguins were something that whenever I said, oh, uh, um, they're pangolins are like, what's a pangolin? And then, of course, well, <laughs> COVID hit and they got blamed for something they didn't do, the poor little guys. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's that's so amazing, too. And uh, yeah, you mentioned um, that scene of them getting sucked under, too. And I remember, like, watching these styles of films when I, I was a kid. And it's almost like when you watch them as an adult, they're not too scary. But when you're a child, like, you kind of get lost into these films. And it's almost like... Uh, a children's version of a horror like i remember watching like labyrinth and thinking that's that was a scary movie at the time and i felt like you did such a good job of kind of bringing back that vibe and uh but also making it like maybe intense and scary at times but also very family friendly you know like, so that had to Absolutely. be like a bit of like um, a challenge of how i guess far you can go without getting too intense but in uh, everything Look, I'm always mindful of just how far you can you can push the envelope, particularly when you're dealing with some pretty heavy subject matter. But mm -hmm. kids like a scare as much as an adult does in, yeah. in a safe space. You know what I mean? As long as there, there's no real threat and there's no real harm, then we all like a bit of a jump scare. We all like to, to be sort of just on the edge of our seat occasionally. So kids are no different. You know, I think they're the kind of things that, you know, probably wake them up from from what's going on in the world at the moment and yeah. and yeah i i suppose coming back to some of those those early films i mean i remember vividly the, the scene where david bowie just kind of comes up in labyrinth and just steps up and over and you go well there's nothing inherently threatening or scary about that but that's an image that that created that sense of you know, dread and 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 wonder at the same time. And I think the word wonder was always in my mind with this one. It, it is really how, how do I create that sense of wonder? How do I how do I bring that back? I, I think in my first film I had this sense of wonder throughout the film because and that was a film called Dinosaur Island. Probably because it was my first film and I was just in awe of the process anyway. And I yeah. didn't know what I was doing and I was just going through it and it was it was amazing, so that was cool. I think I lost it a bit in some of the some of the, the some of the different formulaic elements that I had in my second film. Although there's still some wondrous elements there too. But this one here, I just really wanted to take people on a journey, and because the below is the landscape of the mind, that is the world that our characters visit, and you know, for many reasons, it really is a dreamscape. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and uh i feel like some of the things that uh, stole the show for me were the characters they meet along the way uh 
just uh, like had me laughing and and again even though like it's a family friendly movie i was just thoroughly enjoying this like all the different personalities and it kept me like intrigued where they were going with it and everything and uh yeah do you have like do you have like a favorite uh character like uh throughout the movie Uh, look i I think the character that has the most amount of heart is Pling, obviously, and I, I, I love what he brings to that. I love what Darius Williams brought to that role as well. And um, we're looking at, well, we're going into a TV series with this whole thing. So I'm, cool. I'm really exploring what um, he's going to bring to that role throughout. So Pling's going to be a major character there. I, I, Ego and Ergo were like the, they're good friends of mine, the, the actors who, who played those roles. And um, you're actually a husband and wife team. And so they did do the reads in the booth together. Oh, cool. And the, the funny thing was that they they never broke character. So even when they were, we got the rushes back, there were some moments where they're kind of bickering about how they're going to do it, but they were still in character. It was absolutely hilarious. So, <laughs> yeah, awesome. and they, they were just great to work with. So, yeah, Ego and Ergo is something that I, I actually wrote that character with those two in mind. Ah, oh, cool. It was it was wonderful to see them bring to that character to life. Yeah, that was one of my favorites too. And even just, uh, yeah, like now that you say it too, there was like such natural <laughs> chemistry with the dialogue and like the, the bickering, the back and forth, the jokes and everything. It was so cool. Um, even um, I thought um, the kids who you casted too did such a fantastic job and even i can imagine when writing a story like this you're you want to find the right people to do it too and i kind of want to know like a little bit about the casting project and uh when you seen these two where you just like these are the ones because they knocked it out of the park in my opinion absolutely i mean when you're casting when you're casting kids it's really interesting actually because you're not just casting the child, you're also casting the parent, you're casting for the look, you're casting for the ability. You're, there, there are a multitude of factors when when dealing with child actors. And um, look, both of them, I think, did a remarkable job. We, we cast Australia-wide, and my casting agent, Nora Fay, were just fantastic. I had Mary and Jade and, um, and Lee from Laura Fay on this, and they they brought the kids through. We saw a lot of different kids. Um, Obviously, Alila came in and just had craft beyond her years. She was an incredible standout. Uh, And at nine, I was was worried about how how far we were going to be able to push that character. And she really embodied it. She, In fact, basically, when Alila came in, it was just like, okay, that's very... She looked like Verity. She sounded like Verity. That was that was her. She did a great job. Sam actually came through a friend of mine, uh, Joanne Samuel, who uh, was running a an acting school up in the Blue Mountains where I used to live. And she was also in my second film, My Pet Dinosaur. And uh, fun fact, she was Mad Max's wife in the first Mad Max. Oh, cool. So, <laughs> yeah. But uh, she... She knew I was doing the casting and she actually suggested that I take a look at this kid called Sam Everingham. And I was like, well, yeah, he, I saw his headshot, and looked the part, saw yeah. a, a, uh, a small reel of his and he was very, very good. So we got him down into the mix to, to see how he, he worked with the rest of the candidates. And once again, he was a standout. And putting those two together, it just made total sense. They... They they enact they reacted well together, and they yeah there was a good bond. Mm-hmm. I can uh, even imagine how challenging it is with um that much special effects to kind of get the characters in the movie like telling them okay there's like an army of Ella or uh, armadillos here and like they but um, when I watch the film too it it really feels like they're just in this scene in this world so I kind of want to know a little bit behind the scenes if there was any extra methods you do with your actors to kind of get them more immersed uh, within like a CG created world. Sure. Um, it's interesting you, you asked that because we did actually have some ultra short throw projection screens. So sort of two meters by two meters, we had two of those set up almost like a, like a volume 
And this was before we shot back in 2019. So this was before the whole LED Mandalorian thing had sort of become available. And so we used the, the short throw technology and we projected some of the backgrounds up onto that. So the kids, so live, we could move the backgrounds around and match lighting and do those kind of things in CG. So that was really handy. And the kids were then able to get a sense of where they were. We then removed the backgrounds and shot green screen as well. So that gave me the most amount of flexibility, particularly for wide shots and moving shots and all sorts of things. Because I mean, two by three sounds big, and it probably is if you had it in your, your lounge room, but it's really not big enough when you're dealing with kids who need to move around a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, and um, one thing, another thing I really like enjoyed too, um, just kind of like the narrative in some of the themes in the movie of uh, just kind of like overall overcoming self doubt and like having stories of like anxiety and stuff. And even I remember as a young kid too, that was something I heavily deal dealt with. And I think it's always cool when, whether it's art, a movie, a song, like um, some of these pieces can kind of, uh, I don't know, just kind of have a certain message to just kind of push forward and like step out of your comfort zone too and everything. And, and again, like it's the secret kingdom really had a great um, theme throughout it of, of overcoming things and i just want to know um you growing up was that something that was like close to you or just something uh within your life that you wanted to put into this film look i i've dealt with lots of things i, I think any person in the pursuit of creativity um in the pursuit of anything that is hard in life can can fall prey to you know, the, the failures uh, that, that can be inherent in that, um, the anxieties that can be inherent in that. And fear it can, it comes in all shapes and sizes and it's universal. It comes to everybody. It doesn't matter your your economic status or your you know, your, your background, your walks of life. It, fear is, is a, a constant in everyone's world, and particularly in the modern-day society where you don't just hunt the mammoth, run from the mammoth, then you can relax. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to be an, an ever conscious creep that is is in people's worlds. And so even though anxiety can come in different forms for everybody, um, how everyone deals with that is kind of the measure of people. And I, and I think that it is when you push through that when you step outside your comfort zone, that's really when you the greatest adventures are to be had and the greatest rewards are to be had as well. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, I kind of think uh, some of the biggest growth in my personal life too was like prior to it, it's moments of fear, you know, and just kind of like stepping over that line and uh, overcoming things. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so it's, yeah, it's just beautiful that you put uh, a lot of different themes into this movie and everything too and um you also mentioned too which i didn't know this is turning into a series as well yes and, that's uh, right sorry i've just noticed the sun was streaming in after that overcoming of fear and uh, <laughs> yeah, that's okay uh, look at this. i look like a jj abrams movie now. Yeah, yeah you got you got that's... the the lens flare and everything it's pretty epic <laughs> but it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go actually most people listen to the audio versions even though i do put this on youtube as well so yeah it's all good but um exactly. yeah <laughs> even um yeah so uh this is also like turning into like a tv series and are you allowed to speak a little bit about uh where it's absolutely at? where you, the it, it will be dealing with you know a new new protagonist per episode but really um touching on some of the, the different things that uh, people find fearful in their life, you know, and and there will be a, an overarching series arc. The Shroud will, will be ever-present. Nice. But there'll be a, 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 whole, uh, a whole army of new characters as well. Oh, that's so exciting. And, uh, mm. yeah, are, are you in just uh, production of this right now? Are you writing phase or, like... Well, we're, we're in the... We're in, the writing and development phase at the moment of this, but yeah, we, we should be going into production towards the end of the year. 
we've already started some of the the CG tests with the new with the new um, this new technology uh, mm. Unreal Engine, which I used for the Secret Kingdom movie. Oh, cool! Is, uh, it's it's just gone leaps and bounds, and it's new rendering technology. It's just I'm, I'm literally looking at a whole bunch of pangolins with this new path tracing tech, and it looks just beautiful. Oh, that's it's awesome! Incredible. Yeah, yeah um, so. and I, I I heard of Unreal Engine through like following stuff in the video game world too. So I that's interesting for me too because I didn't know it was also implemented in the the movie world. I guess it makes sense because it's like again like they keep updating it and it's becoming just yeah. insane with the technology. Yeah, look, I think this is certainly one of the uh, the first theatrical releases um, for a feature film that uses Unreal Engine to this level of you know implementation. This is all final pixels from Unreal Engine, so that means that it was actually rendered. It wasn't like just prehised or projected and mm -hmm. and shot that way. So all the characters, all the effects, everything went through Unreal. And Epic have really got a, a special product on their hands here. And it, it, look, we have, there's 1,248 visual effects in the film. And was if I was to go back to the traditional pipeline. I could maybe have done 500 of those. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the, the speed increase, the, the time that is saved and the time that is saved in reacting in real time to these things is, is it's remarkable. It's, a, it's an incredible piece of gear and uh, I'm looking forward to all the new stuff they put in it's just so fun. I just yeah, geek out with stuff. I really do. <laughs> yeah, same with me. Same with me. And uh, even like um, with this series too, I noticed a lot of people uh, kind of gravitate to these interview segments who are creators themselves as well. And mm -hmm. I just kind of want to know if you have any like general advice for anybody who's maybe just inspired to kind of dip into the fantasy world and create something that's maybe like a secret kingdom of their own? Uh, learn everything to do with the film uh, making process. And that's from writing to obviously directing, but learn the technology. It's all there and available to you now. Um, I used DaVinci Resolve, which we did the edit and the sound mix and the dialogue edits and let, from, from start to finish. DaVinci was involved and Unreal Engine was involved. And as part of DaVinci, you have Blackmagic Fusion as well, which is what I used to composite in. So taking the, the footage of the kids and putting them into that CG world. So it's you, you need to know every aspect of it if you're going to create something like this. And I think, look, even if you don't want to create fantasy and you want to just make movies in general, it's really, really important to understand at a hands-on level, the entire process of production and post-production and delivery as well. You know, you've got mm -hmm. all your legals and you've got all your, your all the accounting, all that kind of thing. Like it's the film business is a business and it has to be approached as such. And as much as I get caught up in the creative and the and the wonder side of things, I'm very, very mindful of the fact that you know we're we're dealing with commoditized art here as well mm -hmm. yeah and that's a good thing because without the commoditization of it no one will see what you create so that's a really important end of things make sure you have that business end down because otherwise you can spend years doing something that nobody will see mm, facts very well said too yeah definitely have to be like a symbiotic relationship there because like some people can go all in on either side and i even notice sometimes on the business side they're asking for things that aren't possible but they just don't know and also the yeah. other side of thing where you can get too into your head as a creative and and it just doesn't work as like a marketing thing like it's all over the place but that's that's very great advice yeah look i think the other thing too if you know every aspect of it um you won't fall prey to some of the some of the sharks out there who might want to, and, and I mean across the board, uh, across yeah. the, the production end, the post-production end, the business side of things, you know, you you will know, you will have your eyes wide open. And if 
if someone pulls out of a project at the last minute, you can pick up where they left off and keep going. It doesn't kill all the work you've put into it. And um, yeah, that's that's it's an important thing. And pay people. Make sure you pay people. <laughs> Very important. No one, no one should be, you know, making your art for free. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and even like I feel like. I've done like some very low budget things too. And I came out of pocket too. Cause I know like sometimes just when there's a big, there's like just good moral support around and vibes and like make people feel valued to be there. The work is going to be so much better too. And absolutely, yeah. 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 It absolutely. will. And um, yeah, I, I think so long as people aren't there feeling like they're going to, um, feeling like they, well, yeah, you, you have to make them feel valued and that their time is 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 worth it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, that's why I, I think paying people is a very good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the original way of showing somebody you appreciate. Them. Yeah, <laughs> and it's timeless as well. You know, it never goes yeah. out of style. Yeah, and uh... plus it also saves on headaches down the line. You can, should you be successful and you need things like chain of title. And, Mm-hmm. shows that uh, you know that, that that's a really important one actually because with people like uh, my distributors there in the US the, the chain of title is very stringent they have to cover themselves when they're going to put your film out across the the US in cinemas and on VOD and all those things so yeah business I know this is the boring end of filmmaking but it's a it's the most important that's why we're having this conversation because that was covered yeah no i i totally love this too like especially like on the series i feel like sometimes i do take too deep of a dive on the creative side and this is again reality importance and everything if you actually want to do this and uh and yeah and also i can't say it enough this was like such a wonderful film and um yeah i just really appreciate your time uh talking to me on the day of the release honored for that um I told a couple no, no, no. I, I wanted to talk to you, particularly because I've already thought about what I could put in your green screen there behind. Yeah, me. hell yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first one to make a meme of me. So that'd be awesome. But <laughs> <laughs> I know you know what you're doing too. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And uh even um like when I watched the the screener last week too, I already told a couple of my friends who are parents with kids that this is uh genuinely uh, a must watch for them too as well too so i'm really excited to kind of see more reviews of people watching this film because uh, i really think it's something special and you did a fantastic job thank you very much i really appreciate that yeah well i'm gonna let you go enjoy your release day and everything i know it's morning for you and uh, Hope uh, you can pop a bottle of champagne or something. And uh... I'm just going with coffee to start with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks again, Matt. And uh, hopefully talk to you again on your next project. Absolutely. My pleasure. Hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Matt as much as I did. What a hardworking and brilliant dude. Like I mentioned in the intro, The Secret Kingdom is available everywhere on VOD right now and in select theaters across North America. Definitely check this one out if you you got kids, you know somebody who has kids, or you yourself just wants to have some wholesome fun. I totally recommend this. And before we go, like always, I gotta thank all of you legends on the Patreon page. First up, Mike Carniello of the Testing with Mike YouTube channel. Amanda McKnight of Top 10 Nerd, and the ever so awesome Amanda McKnight YouTube channel, Ryan Watkins of Ryan Radio, the wonderful Jenny Potter, the legendary Devin McBride, Ryan frickin' Campbell, my favorite soul singer, Saber, and last but not least, Francis Coffer, aka my mom. If you want to support the show and get each and every one of these episodes early, uncut, uncensored, right when we're done the Zoom call, I take that file and I just post it over on patreon.com slash the creative and balance. And beyond the shout out and getting some content early, at the end of the day, you'll also go to bed at night just knowing you're a badass motherfucker who supports raw, uncut, independent media, and nobody can take that away from you. 
All right. Thanks again for checking out the episode and supporting the show. Got another amazing talk dropping in the next few days with our new friends from Disney Pixar. Yeah, it's a big episode. And I thank you for rocking with me. Catch you then. Peace. Peace.